Okay, so my name is Jonathan Gitlin, and I am a senior scientist at the Marine Biology Biological Laboratories. And um, I've been here for a little more than two years. Um, my scientific history or career is one of uh, that of a physician scientist. Um, I'm trained as a pediatrician and a specialist in um, newborns, and that interest is in both the, the care of newborns and the developmental biology associated with human development and birth. And my research has is is always been interested or always focused on um, optimizing fetal maternal outcomes, and largely that has been focused on the broad area of birth defects. And so um, human birth defects account for the most significant proportion of morbidity and mortality in childhood. A way to think about that is childhood congenital heart disease, which is very common. Um, so I've always had the great privilege of having a scientific life where I could care for patients, which has been extraordinarily rewarding. I've had the opportunity to to be in a field that really grew up as I trained in it. And so I had the very poignant and powerful and meaningful experience of dealing with a lot of parents and helping them as their children passed away. And that helped my own growth and development as a person um, um, and got an extremely rewarding career from that. I was able to deal with human developmental biology at the bedside. Um, I was able to deal with a lot of teaching. I love to teach and I was able to influence a lot of um, people in terms of thinking about the quality of care, what it means to hold someone's hand, what it means to think, and most importantly, what it means to look at a situation in a human, a medical situation, really a scientific situation, and say, why is this so? What's happening here? What is this all about? Taking that curiosity at the bedside and bringing it back to the laboratory. And I owe that to my postdoctoral mentor, Judah Folkman, who was um, an extraordinary um, individual. He was a surgeon and a physician scientist and um, had a profound influence. He taught me very much that um, every room, every patient, there's, there are questions, there are things to wonder about. Um, and it has the dual benefit of being a, a focal point of thinking about profound scientific issues and also bringing that science back to the benefit of mankind. And although people now think about this incorrectly as things like translational science and things that are really nonsense, um, and, and it's really crossed a false divide between people who say, well, I study biology for the sake of biology, and you know those other people, they, they're only interested in, in so curing cancer. It's all nonsense. Einstein said it best that, you know, the, that you know, science absent a benefit to humankind is of no value at all. And this, of course, is true. On October 17, 1992, at 8.35 in the evening, a film came out of the film developer, and Yukitoshi and I looked at it, and I knew what the Wilson disease gene was. For the last 10 years, I had this concept of trying to understand how copper got from the Earth's crust into proteins where it was so essential for function. Copper sits in cytochrome oxidase in your mitochondria and is essential for oxygen metabolism. It sits in the, in the blood of horseshoe crabs, which is why they have blue blood, as hemocyanin and is essential for their oxygen transport. In fact, copper is utilized more than iron is in heme for oxygen transport on this planet. And as you may remember from Star Trek episode 57, in Vulcan, it's a copper containing protein which is used for, for oxygen. But as you may or may not remember, but when the cloud attacked everybody on the ship and uh, uh, Spock decided to go in the room, Kirk was very upset because he knew that Spock was sacrificing his life, but he came back out and Bones couldn't figure it out, but Vulcan and the, but Spock informed them that, you know, that on Vulcan they have a copper containing protein that carries oxygen, and so therefore they figured out that the cloud was attacking the heme component of uh, and uh, I always wanted to write a grant on that to, for the cover. But the point of this whole thing is, right, that, you know, 
I was curious about that since I was 15 and bled horseshoe crabs and saw that blue blood. And then at that moment in 1992, I knew something that nobody else knew. I knew how it was that copper moved around in cells. I had no idea yet how exciting it was going to be. I had no idea that nature filled this out, figured this out millions of years ago. It looked at copper and it said, ooh, I could really use that. That is a facile electron exchange. Man, I could, I could, I could move electrons around with this. I, this, and then, but ooh, that is way too dangerous. Jesus, if I start fooling around with that with oxygen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna oxidize the hell out of myself. How the hell am I gonna manage this? But it kept coming back to it and it figured out a way. Grab it, put it into chaperones, transport it with this protein. That protein, which was developed, that transport ATPase, exists in you and I. And when there's a loss of function of it, a genetic loss of function, it creates this disease called Wilson's disease, which I've always been interested in. But you go from that disease to how does it happen to this incredibly conserved protein, to an understanding of how metals move around in cells and back to ways to think about human biology. Um, you know, the thing about science that's so important and that I had the privilege of understanding in my career is that, you know, art, music, literature, poetry, the Red Sox, whatever it is, you know, these things, they, they feed our soul. They help us to understand who we are in the world. You know, you, you, you look at, you go to Florence and you look at the David and, you know, you, you can't speak. You look at it and you think to yourself, you expect it to move. And from being around the David and thinking about Michelangelo and thinking about human creativity, you begin to understand yourself and you begin to understand more about what matters to you in the world and this helps you to relate to other people. Science is different. Science drives society forward. Absent science, there's no human progress. Now, some people worry about this and they, they mistake the accrual of knowledge with the fear of what we'll do with knowledge. <clears throat> and we have to constantly be aware of what we'll do with knowledge, right? But Elie Wiesel probably said it best when asked, where was God at Auschwitz? So Elie Wiesel was the survivor. He's an emeritus professor at BU. He was a childhood survivor of Auschwitz. And he said, the question is not where was God, the question is where was man? And that ultimately, to me, is the answer for what we do with knowledge. The accrual of knowledge is our ultimate goal, the accrual of new knowledge. As individuals, as people, as the people we influence, as the people we talk to, it's what we do with that knowledge that matters, right? And we can't be afraid of that ever for a moment. In the tradition that I come from, we also say we can never forget, right? We always have to remember what direction we might go in, but we also have to remember it in the other direction. Whenever I talk to people about science, I always use the very elegant example of polio. So John Enders and Tom Weller and Fred Robbins got the Nobel Prize for their discovery of the growth of the polio virus. And people don't understand that because they think, well, Salk and Sabin got the Nobel Prize. They didn't, they didn't deserve it. They didn't actually do very much. Sabin was a great, virologist in his own right. But the thing there is, John Enders went back in the lab one day, everyone was trying to cure polio. Uh, uh, um, Roosevelt had decided the time was right. He sent Basil O'Connor, his science advisor, out. You know, they started the Infantile Paralysis Society, which became the March of Dimes. My mom and everybody else went around with dimes and they collected money. And, but everybody was trying to grow the polio virus in nervous tissue because it's a nervous disease. And John Enders went back one day and said, maybe if it's hand to mouth, maybe it grows in mesenchyme. And in fact, originally they did a lot of the work inverting mouse intestine on glass tubes and rolling those glass tubes and growing the virus. They went back in the lab the next day and the virus was growing. That was it. And the thing that's interesting about that story is it's a very good example of this paradigm which we have over in the MRC, which St. Georgie is, 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 is quoted saying, which is, you know, science is looking where everyone else has looked, 
but seeing what no one else has seen. And that's what John Enders did. He looked where everyone else was looking. Everyone was trying to grow it. But he saw what no one else had seen, and the virus grew. And talk about translational science and this nonsense about how we know everything and we're just not translating it and it takes so much time. Seven years after that discovery, David Garraway announced on the Today Show that the vaccine worked. Cars stopped in the streets. Church bells rang out. My parents lived in that era and told me about it. This was the defeat of a disease which was essentially endemic in the summers and which caused tremendous suffering and agony. It no longer exists except for in very small parts of the world. The MBL is a place where if we preserve it, if we do it right, if we maintain what it really is, okay, someone will discover something of tremendous value. And if you wonder what that value might be, come with me to Boston Children's Hospital where I train and walk down the hallways. Neuroblastoma, lupus, sickle cell disease, brain cancer, cystic fibrosis. Children are a third of the population, but a hundred percent of the future. Investing in them and investing in discovery that will make a difference in their lives is the whole hope of mankind. And it's within our grasp in the next 25 years to eliminate all disease. People don't realize that, but if we put the effort into it and we put the time into it and we put the focus into it, but it's not a war on cancer. That's a well-meaning and well-intentioned and important thing. 175,000 new patients will go to the Sydney Farber Cancer Institute this year. My father and my sister died of cancer, and my sister died of cancer before she reached the age of 60, awaiting a lung transplant from a complication from her treatment. It affects all our lives. But I know that somebody here at the MBL working out on something that has nothing to do with that, wondering about what molecules might be out in the ocean that covers 80% of the surface of our planet and is as unexplored and unknown as Mars, okay? that therein lies the truth to things which we could only imagine. And if you were a little kid, Imagine the possibilities and the opportunities. Imagine grabbing the imagination of young people to do that exploration. That's what the MBL is about. All institutions change, and the MBL is now going through a process of change. I want to go on record as predicting the outcome of that change, which will be glorious. All the MBL needs to do is to remember Kodak. Okay? Now, 15 or 20 years ago, it was inconceivable to people that Kodak would not be around. Kodak had beaten Fuji. It was the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? If you drive through downtown Rochester today, you'll see there's no Kodak, okay? The mistake that the CEO and all of the organization in Kodak made when they had it in their grasp to succeed, they had the first digital camera, was they thought they were selling film. They had these little yellow boxes and they would talk about them and say, you don't understand, it's a Kodak moment. They forgot that they were making memories. The only thing the MBL has to do when it looks back on its 125 years, okay, is remember what the essence was of what the MBL was doing. We're not the Lilly Building. We're not the Center for Ecosystems. We're not We've always done it this way. What we are is the discoveries that have happened here and the essence of the milieu that allowed those discoveries to happen. The milieu that allowed a young MD, PhD student named Ron Vale to be so excited about his work here that he abandoned his clinical studies, never went back and finished his clinical training, okay? because he was so curious and so fascinated and so able to find those motors that move things around in the cell. He wasn't trying to cure cancer. He was trying to ask a basic biological question and he was curious and he was bright and he had all the right mix in all the right environment. That's the MBL, right? And there are lots of other Ron Vales out there for lots of other problems. And oh, by the way, 
there must be 15 drugs currently used for diseases, including cancer, which are the byproduct of understanding the basic biology of molecular motors and things that move organelles around in cells that was Ron's discovery. It has a very deep and rich history of discovery. What is any institution about? It's not about the buildings. It's not about the way things have been done. It's about preserving the opportunity for the accrual of new knowledge. The only thing that advances mankind is the accrual of new knowledge. Again, in the tradition I come from, one of the most important things is speaking truth and speaking truth to power. We can influence change and we can influence the outcome of this affiliation by talking about the things that I'm talking about and by focusing on the things that matter. I believe there's another great 125 years ahead for the human race and for the MBL doing that kind of discovery. I do. When Darwin was a young man, 19, not yet gone around the horn, not yet reached to the, Gal the, the Galapagos, the geologist who had supported this trip and who had gotten him this berth on the ship, he was sending specimens back to him from the Amazon, big leaves and things. And the geologist wrote to him and said, what, what are you doing? What are all these specimens? What's going on? What are you discovering? And Darwin wrote in his diary something which, when I read this, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. He wrote, I, I don't know. He goes, but my mind is a chaos of delight. That's what the MBL is. The MBL is a place where young people can come and their mind will be a chaos of delight. They'll be struggling, they'll be thinking, they'll be doing what every scientist does. We are immersing ourselves in the maintenance and protection and growth of a milieu, a soil, into which young, brilliant seeds can be planted. It's not up to us to decide or to say what those seeds will grow into. Who knows what will be discovered here? But we must maintain a passion for that soil. We are, we are the curators and the managers and the protectors of that soil. It will always be here in some form. The pot will change. We may have to move it differently because the rain may change or the sun may be in a different direction. But we always keep the soil and we always encourage it as a place for seeds, young seeds to be planted. And you walk around this place and the young seeds are extraordinary. Ultimately, a place like the MBL must be preserved because of that essence, because of that soil. We'll come to know, we'll come to understand. And for me, what does it mean to be at the MBL? What does it mean to be a scientist here? What does it mean to have the opportunity to talk to you? It means I get to be, for one brief moment in time, a small part of that. That's extraordinary.